Before we get into our message, we certainly want to commend all for making our past VBS last week such a success to the teachers and students and to those who helped in the refreshments. We just uh, very much want to say thank you and hope we will continue with that spirit of cooperation in all that we do in the spring work. I was trying to think about what I would call this particular sermon because it's going to be about Rehoboam. And I started just to call it Rehoboam. That would be sufficient. But then I thought about, uh, are you like Rehoboam? And then I thought about, to all those who walk in the ways of Rehoboam. You know, that's not just in the Bible, as I've said countless times, just to inform us about this part of the history of ancient Israel. As is stated, and we've quoted most often, it was written for our Christians learning, Romans 15, 4. It was written for our Christians, admonition, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11. So as we study through this, we'll be noting toward the end of the lesson specific thing that stands out about this man. But I think it's good to remember that he was in as rich a kingdom as there ever has been. The borders of Israel and the United Kingdom had spread as far as it would under his father, King Solomon. He was of the royal household. He was the crown prince. He would be treated with deference. He would receive the best there was to offer of that day and time. He would, as it were, want for nothing and be used to having everything cater to his whim. He was a royal personage, and in America that might be somewhat hard to grasp the implications of what that means, especially in the old oriental courts of absolute monarchs. But I want you to keep that in mind when we, get, when we go through the lesson, especially toward the end. Now, understanding something about him, and I will just briefly go through the life of Rehoboam, so I'll be just giving book, chapter, and verses, and you can uh, read about them. Because that idolatry had developed during the reign of Solomon, then the United Kingdom of Israel divided into the kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, 1 Kings 11, 1 through 13. So you see, before Rehoboam came to the throne, the seeds of discontent had been there for some time. And by the way he would conduct himself would make a great deal of difference as to what would transpire as we who are familiar with the Bible know did happen regarding Rehoboam. His father was Solomon, 2 Chronicles 9.31. I think most of us know that, if not all. His mother was Naamah, who was an Ammonitist. She could have been very well one who influenced Solomon and Israel to worship Milcom, who was, as the Bible says, the abomination of the Ammonites, 2 Chronicles 12, 13, 1 Kings 11, 1, and 5, and chapter 14, 21 through 4. He came to the throne when he was 41 years old, 2 Chronicles 12, 13. And to be crowned or to go to his coronation, he journeyed to Shechem, 2 Chronicles 10, 1. And one of the things that we need to emphasize here that we'll come back to toward the end of the lesson and think of what I said about how he would have been reared, he, his arrogance and foolish advice then led to a rebellion. And that rebellion was led by Jeroboam resulting in 10 of the tribes becoming the kingdom of Israel, 2 Chronicle 10, 2 through 19, the northern kingdom. 
just a remark or two about Jeroboam. He had already ran from Solomon and gone into Egypt where he bides his time. He knows his politics. Thus he knows the situation in the minds of the people and he knows how to work that. Once the kingdom was divided, Rehoboam would have gone to war to unite it. But here's what gets interesting in God's providential care of things, which ought to make us stop and think about things sometimes. The Lord actually stopped Rehoboam from reuniting Israel. And he continued to build up Judah, 2 Chronicles 11, verses 1 through 12. The priests and the Levites came from all over Israel, the northern kingdom and southern kingdom, because the temple was in Jerusalem, and it was a part of the southern kingdom of Judah. All of this time, uh, for three years, they walked, the scripture says, the ways of David and Solomon, 2 Chronicles 11, 13 through 17. I can make a bit of a joke about what I'm about to say, but some of his foolishness, which really stands out, it also stood out regarding Solomon, though he was the wisest man, for God gave him that wisdom in the governing of his people. Because Rehoboam had 18 wives, he had 60 concubines, he had 28 sons and 60 daughters. 2 Chronicles 11, 18 through 21. Now, you might want to think about this sometimes when a few children begin to bother you. <laughs> and when the wives sometimes uh, are as wives are. His son, Abijah, Abijah was uh, prepared to be his successor, Second Chronicles 11, verses 22 through 23. I say that things went well and God strengthened the southern kingdom of Judah for three years. But Rehoboam went wrong. He forsook the Lord, 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 1. Because of that, Pharaoh Shishak, king of Egypt, Pharaoh of Egypt, took what was the fortified cities of Judah and came up against Jerusalem in 925 B.C., 2 Chronicles 12 Two through four. Shemaiah the prophet explains it was because that they forsook the Lord. Second Chronicles twelve and five. So the kingdom begins to shrink from where it was with Solomon when the kingdom divided, and now it even shrinks more. The strength of the kingdom wasn't there, all due to this one man's <laughs> lack of spiritual leadership. The leaders at this time of Israel and Rehoboam humbled themselves according to the record in 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 6. And the Lord acknowledged their humility. But he grants only partial deliverance. 2 Chronicles 12, 7 through 12. Rehoboam reigned some 17 years in Jerusalem. 2 Chronicles 12, 13. And the scripture records that he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. 2 Corinthians 12, or rather Chronicles 12 and verse 14. One of the things we see from 2 Corinthians, uh, keep saying Corinthians, it should be Chronicles. <laughs> 2 Chronicles. One of the things we see is that Rehoboam of Judah was in constant warfare with the northern kingdom who was being ruled, which was being ruled by Jeroboam. When he died, he was buried in the city of David, and his son began to reign, 2 Chronicles 12, 16. So that's just very brief about this man. And if you go through the Bible concerning the kings to follow him over Judah or the kings to rule over the northern kingdom of Israel, then you can find out much about them. And there are great lessons to be learned that will benefit you in your service to God, things not to do and things to do. And I'd like for us to look at some of those lessons now. Rehoboam followed the advice of his younger counselors. 2 Chronicles 10, 13 through 14. Now remember, he was 41 when he came to the throne. 
So his friends were likely to be about the same age. Even so, Rehoboam rejected the counsel of the more aged, the more experienced, thus wiser counselors. Now I want to pause here, as I said I would, and give some emphasis on why I decided to say that this lesson is to all those who walk in the ways of Rehoboam. God in His infinite wisdom, which I shall say more, the Lord willing, this afternoon in the sermon, as far as the blood-bought body of Christ, the church, the kingdom of God, as He organized it, saw fit to place elders to supervise it, deacons to serve, preachers of the gospel and teachers of the Bible to be active in it, everyone being ready unto every good work as the New Testament speaks of that good work. If you will notice when you read about what the Bible says, a man is not considered wise simply because he accumulates a lot of years. If you'll look at the qualification of elders, you will see that when they meet those qualifications, they're demonstrating that they are mature Christians and that they are in a position then to do the work God gave them to do. Now, there would be no elders in a faithful church of the Lord if God Almighty in organizing it hadn't put them there. I think that's important to understand. And their major work, of course, is to see that the thing God ordained the church to do is done and done the quickest and best way possible. Their concern and their service is for the good of the church, not to do as they please. When you go back to Rehoboam and you read about this in 2 Chronicles 10, 13 through 14, you will see that he wanted to hear what suited him. You will see that God makes it clear in the Word of God. It reads the same way in your Bible it does mine, and I don't know what you may get out of it, but I know what you ought to, especially younger people. They need to learn to listen to those who have proven their life. It seems that that's a big problem in this day and age, and we hear a whole lot about the millennials at a certain age. Well, I'm sure there are exceptions there, and there's always been people, we could just call Rehoboam a, a millennial. He was interested in what suited him, being done his way. He'd been reared that way. Everything favored him. He's the crown prince. Nobody's going to really deal with him in a rough manner unless it would be his father. And when he was younger, maybe his mother. He is being groomed to be the king. Again, I say we don't appreciate this a lot because we never lived in a kingdom where the king or the monarch was absolute. His word was law. But you see, even where that happened, then there should have been some common sense. The facing of the reality that younger people just haven't been where older people have been. That may come as a strange thing, but that's just a matter of fact. Why do you think the inspired word of God in this part of the Bible that Paul said was written for our learning, also for our admonition, records this account? And the idea was that the ten northern tribes said, you know, your daddy has just beat us over the head with taxes. We can't take any more. If you understand that about our situation, we'll be glad to serve you. But if you don't, we won't. That doesn't take a genius to understand that. And probably if we were alive at that time, we'd understand it a whole lot better as to what had gone on. Really, all you have to do is read what all Solomon did and to know that the money had to come from somewhere and it came from the people. So what does Rehoboam do? He goes to the older men who were alive and had worked with his father as advisors and they say, lighten up on them. Keep the kingdom united. After all, Rehoboam really wanted that. There's no doubt about that. 
But he also wanted to be what real boy wanted to be, and it was all a matter of everything centered around him, and he would have it his way to keep them united. So he wasn't really interested in what he heard from the older men. So he goes to those roughly his age, his friends. And I promise you those friends were aristocrats. And you notice that he has quite a few brothers. <laughs> and I don't know where all those friends came from, but you're not going to be too buddy-buddy with the crown prince unless you're pretty much an aristocrat of some kind. That's always been the case, and all you have to do is know a little bit of history about the European kingdoms to see that that's the case. You're always treated as somebody special. Well, when he didn't hear what he wanted to hear, he went to the people that would tell him what he wanted to hear. So he came back to those of the northern kingdom and said, if you think my father was tough on you, you just see what's going to happen with me. Their exclamation was, Israel to your tents. In other words, forget him. Well, there's Jeroboam sitting down there in Egypt just saying, perfect. And he had no scruples. He wanted the kingdom. He cares nothing about the law of Moses. He wanted a kingdom. And so he takes advantage of their disgruntlement, extreme disgruntlement, and he goes back and takes over. If you read history at all, you'll see that kind of thing happen all through history, happens today, and will continue to happen. So he set up two gods. He had to come up with, or rather two idols. He had to come up with um, priests. So he had to keep them away from the temple in Jerusalem. The law required all men to appear three times a year. Sacrifices were offered. The people were used to that. So he had to get them away. Well, this tells you something about the ignorance and fickleness of the people, they were so disgruntled, upset, and already the kingdom under Solomon had started to be softened by the lack of teaching that should have gone on, and so they're glad to go to Dan and Bathsheba and worship a golden calf, if you please. So the whole thing goes on from there, all because of a young man who knew better than the older men. All because... I don't think I have to do this. Now let me pause again and say, in every congregation of God's people, the church, when it is fully organized according to the direction of Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings and Lord of lords, sitting at the right hand of God, ruling, who is the shepherd of the flock, he has in the organization of the church said elders ought to be there and their elders if they meet these qualifications. They're concerned for the church. They're to see that the obligatory matters God has laid out is carried out, but their main work is to try to figure out the when and the where that God did not specify. You see, we wouldn't need elders to know to assemble on the first day of the week. That's there. You wouldn't need elders to know what's to go on in that assembly. The five acts of worship that we've engaged in here this day. But now mind you, wherever God has legislated an obligation, there has always been a need to say when or who or where. Or how much? Now the Lord said the first day of the week. The church is made up of a number of people. Uh, when on that first day of the week? Somebody's got to have the final say. Who is it? You know, if the light bulb goes off when it should and you know what your New Testament teaches, you'd say regarding the organization of the church, it must be the elders. Who set the time for the Bible class? Who sets the time for the worship period? Who determines who's going to teach what in each class? Somebody has to. Now, you, you, you fail to remember sometimes, to all those who walk in the ways of Jeroboam, that in your own home, you have those things God has enjoined upon you that are obligatory, but in the carrying them out, 
then God has placed the government of the home. And he placed the husband as the head of the house with responsibilities. And the wife and the mother with her responsibilities. And it tells you how the husband ought to be in loving his wife and vice versa. And their duty to their children and their children's duty to them. And every one of those things you're going to have to if you're a husband that has any sense at all, unless you walk in the ways of Jeroboam, you're going to have to say, well, here's when we'll discharge this obligation, or here's how it's going to be done, or here's what I'm going to do. Woe be to the young man, whether he's married or not, or to the young husband, who says, I don't need any advice. I don't need an example to look up to. Nobody's got any more wisdom than I do. I can promise you he won't be what he ought to be to his wife. And he won't be what he ought to be, number one, to himself before God. And he won't be what he ought to be to any children that come along. And in the generation to follow that are of his children, they'll just come by on the problem unless they uh, rebel against the example and teaching that I've just described when they grow old. I want to remind you that this whole problem with Israel began with Rehoboam not listening to aged, wise counsel. I want to remind you, see, I don't have to teach you, most of you knew, you know this, that in the authoritative word of God, elders are set over the church, deacons to serve, and each person in those offices must meet certain qualifications, proving their concern for the church. Now, Rehoboam showed no concern for the kingdom. He showed no concern for anybody else. He was willing to do something. He didn't have to do that. But he wanted his way. He was going to have it. And he did. And it all blew up in his face. Because he rejected counsel of more aged and experienced men. Now if you want to, you can say that's a bunch of hooey. And go on out and be a real boy. But if you see any good in it at all, says Paul said it was written four times for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4, that it is an example to us, then we want to do what we can not to walk in the ways of Rehoboam. Now, if you keep this thought in mind and you go through the Bible, you can find that there are a great many people who have walked in the way of Rehoboam. In fact, if you go up to the northern kingdom, they just went from bad to worse to much worse to completely the Assyrians got them. Judah didn't learn any better. The prophets would say, haven't you learned anything from your sister up north as far as what you should do in service to God? No, they didn't. So as the Assyrians took care of the ten northern apostate tribes, Nebuchadnezzar would take care of other southern kingdom which was primarily Judah and the little tribe of Benjamin but notice that for a little while Rehoboam continued faithful to God 2 Corinthians eleven seventeen, as we've already pointed out he followed in the steps of David and Solomon as they served God now it's important to realize this I hear it often in prayers and it's right we pray for the providential protection of God as the church does only what the Bible authorizes it to do. Notice that second part. As we're faithful to God. As we do only what's authorized by the New Testament. God in His providential care, if I works those things I don't know, that's His business, will take care of the church. If there's anything taught in the book of Revelation and all of its figures and symbols, strange language to us today, it is that the ways of this world are in the hands of Satan. He sang a song a moment ago that says, when things go wrong, when things are looking like the devil's winning. But he's not. Now, if you'll notice the situation, we learned that God would not let Rehoboam reunite the kingdom. He said, let him go. 
Well, of course, we understand that God kept a remnant of the people while he remained a just God. And even though Judah went into Babylonian captivity, they would come back because the Messiah had to come according to the tribe of Judah and the family of David. So a remnant remained, and they were restored. But you'll find that it is said of the evil done in the northern kingdom in the succeeding kings, they sinned like Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Well, we know how wicked that was if we spend any time at all reading about the kings of Israel. But Rehoboam began what was a big problem in Judah. And for the most part, their kings did the same thing. So he was successful, but he seems to be after those three years where God continued to bless him, that there was an arrogance even further developed because of his success in those three years. Second Chronicles 12 and verse 1 makes it clear that he forsook God. And we've already mentioned that Shishak of Egypt came against them and overcame them, Second Chronicles 12, 2 and 5. And this tells me something. It's very easy when you've had some success to become arrogant, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. To think, you know, you've got the world by the tail, as we want to say sometimes. That everything's going my way. And I learned then also from this the value of humility. Rehoboam and the leaders of Israel did humble themselves, 2 Chronicles 12, 6. And that humility brought about deliverance, 2 Chronicles 12, 7. Now, what do I learn? First of all, if I'm faithful, God will providentially work. But he can also take evil people and in his providence make them work to accomplish what he intended to do. And you can see that in that he said, no, Rehoboam, don't go up there and fight against Jeroboam to take the kingdom back and make it one again. But even in that, God was working things. Sometimes we look round about us, even in this nation, and we get the feelings that Christianity cannot go on if this nation ceases to be what the Constitution of the United States says it ought to be. I don't know where we come up with those ideas because you can't find it in the Bible. It doesn't mean we're not to be thankful and do what we can to keep things as they are. But whether there's a United States as we now know it in the future, whether there's not, God's will is going to be done. And God will provide for those even as they're suffering persecution from a government. The book of Revelation, I say a few moments ago, makes it clear that the devil rules in the kingdoms of men. He is the prince of this world. Remember what Jesus told Pilate when he says, I have the power to do this, that, and the other. Jesus simply said, you don't have any power except it was given to you. We should realize that. Folks, there's great comfort in that when we submit to God's will to understand wherever you are and whatever kind of civil government, one that gives us the religious freedoms we enjoy or one that does not, or others that restrict it somewhere in between, God will see you through. Now as we close the lesson, we need to understand, and I don't know why we don't, because it's been said enough by umpteen gospel preachers, and that is the consequences of sin. Now he successfully ruled, that is Rehoboam, but even then it was with limitations, Second Chronicles 12, 8, and verses 12 and 15. We can find forgiveness, but sometimes we have to suffer the consequences of the sins. You say, well, give me an example, alcoholism sexually transmitted diseases, being injured permanently in a wreck because you were out drunk, you can be forgiven of all that and go to heaven. But the wages of sin are kind of tough, and the way of the transgressor is hard. We need to know that. We need to know God's wisdom in organizing the church. We need to know our own attitude toward wisdom 
Wisdom is learning how to do certain things. It's not just the facts. Wisdom is the application of those things. I've said many times, and I'm glad it's been that way, that when I was 16, 17, 18, I was more than happy to listen to the older folks. That has put me in good stead all my life because I always did. I saw fit to go and be with the old folks when the others are out trying to do something because they had things to tell me they couldn't tell me. That is, those of my own age. It'd been where I'd been. It's something to learn. That's one of the big problems that we have in our family situation today. There's not much of an extended family. Used to, grandpa and grandma or some of them were living with the family or close by and there were uncle and aunts. It'd be awful hard to get out there and do something bad that some kinfolk didn't tell your mom and daddy about. Nowadays, you can do just about anything, no matter how wicked, and if the law doesn't find you, you're in good shape as far as getting away with it. But there's a day coming when all this world will be destroyed and we'll be called before the throne of Christ to give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Do we want to wait till then to say, I should have listened? There are a lot of folks who have gone through the school of hard knocks and they got knots on their head and scars to prove it. And that's the only way they can learn. When if they just listen, somebody that knew better than they had been humble to be willing to accept guidance and direction. Surely we understand that in parents. Surely we're expected in our children. How much more so since we study about Rehoboam, unless you love to walk in the ways of Rehoboam, when it comes to the blood-bought body of Christ and the divine organization of the church. You can't improve on it. You can't benefit from it. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation to become a Christian, we urge you to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. He'll add you to his church, and you can serve him faithfully there. As a child of God, if you've committed sin, you need to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Now, are you willing to respond to the gospel invitation? If so, would you do so while we stand and sing?